all to our conference, and I thank Professor Hibbs for opening it. I'm not sure how to respond to an introduction like that, but I, I sort of knew that I wouldn't know what was coming with Francesca, so uh, delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for that very kind introduction. So it's, it's always good to be back in South Bend once winter's finished, and it looks like it is, so glad to be back. Better Call Saul, the AMC spinoff prequel and postscript to Breaking Bad has received nearly universal critical acclaim, a glut of Emmy nominations. It's the seemingly unpromising origin story of Saul Goodman, Bob Odenkirk, previously known as Jimmy McGill, a sleazy opportunistic attorney who offers his services to the central character in Breaking Bad, Walter White. With a time span that bookends the events of Breaking Bad, it also depicts the post-Breaking Bad fate of Saul in his role as Gene, the identity he assumes to escape arrest for his role in the Walter White meth empire. Since the concluding episode finds him being prosecuted for those crimes, there's good reason to see the finale of Better Call Saul as the conclusion to the entire Breaking Bad franchise. Yet the attention in that episode, and even before it, turns away from Walter White and toward a more important figure in Saul's life, Kim Wexler. And with that change, there is a shift in the moral center of the Breaking Bad universe. In Kim, the conscience of the two series is made explicit. That's not to say that with Kim, morality surfaces for the first time. Indeed, these two series, the universe of them, seems infused with morality. In different ways, both shows provide compelling depictions of human evil and its devastating consequences, not just for victims, but also for perpetrators. In this latter way, the series revives an older conception of morality, according to which vice harms not just victims, but also perpetrators, depriving them of capacities for happiness, love, and friendship, and subjecting them to degrees of moral blindness. Writers and producers of these series seem to take every opportunity to double down on the show's moral underpinnings. In an end of Better Call Saul series interview, creator, producer, writer Vince Gilligan was asked about the implication of the shared fate of two quite different characters, Lalo Salamanca and Howard Hamlin. They end up murdered and buried together in the same grave beneath Gus's meth lab. The interviewer wondered whether their being buried together said something about the moral arbitrariness of the universe of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Gilligan's response is telling. Howard Hamlin is basically a good guy. He's not a saint, but yeah, he winds up in the same pit of one of our most chaotically evil characters, Lalo Salamanca. And I guess you could say, oh, this speaks to the randomness of the universe. Writers love irony, and I guess it's ironic that they wind up in the same grave. But to me, there's no message there. That's not us saying, give up trying to find meaning in the world. Everything is meaningless. I think there must be a meaning to this life. Please don't take away that it doesn't matter how you live, good or bad. That is definitely not our message. Although it turned out that way in the case of Howard and Lalo, chaos and anarchy are not what we're selling. The origin story of Breaking Bad focuses on Walter White, who was once on track for a promising career as a scientist. When we meet him in the opening episode, he's a high school chemistry teacher with indifferent students who mock him for his modest economic status. Diagnosed with terminal cancer, he begins to question his lifelong commitment to playing by the rules. Doing so has left him with nothing to show for his life and minimal, if any, inheritance for his family. Envious of the success of his former fiance and lab partner Gretchen and her husband Elliot, he blames them for cutting him out of gray matter technologies, a company that has made them billionaires. 
Chemistry, Walt tells his students in the opening episode, is about change, transformation. And that's just what Breaking Bad is about. The transformation of a mild-mannered conformist into the character he calls Heisenberg, a creative and dominating genius who comes to rule the meth trade in the Southwest. Breaking Bad has something of a classic narrative arc. It traces the rise and fall of its main character. It's especially powerful, I think, in its illustration of the ways in which envy, pride, and wrath feed one another and destroy souls. It's a profound meditation on the unity of the spiritual vices. It also demonstrates the way deception, not just of others, but especially self-deception, is at the root of sustained and deeply ingrained vice. Until the very end, Walt proclaims that what motivates him is a concern to provide for his family. But in a key moment in that last episode, he admits to his wife, Skylar, that his motivation was quite different. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. And I was really, I was alive. Producers of the series have commented that at that moment, the moment he's no longer lying to himself, Walter White is finished. His entire project was predicated on a degree of self-deception. Adopting the tag name Heisenberg, Walt adopts a kind of persona, a mask, that turns his life into a sort of artistic performance, a creation or recreation of self exemplifying a will to power ethic. Particularly in their culminating episodes, both series focus on the theme of confession, but they do so in a way that turns confession itself into a problem. The series raise all sorts of interesting questions about the nature of confession, about the differences between truthful and untruthful confessions, and about the way in which vices can play a role in what we might call self-serving or partial confessions. Straightforward, if often reluctant, confessions of guilt are a staple of many of the old police shows, running from Columbo up through at least CSI Miami. Nearly every episode in the latter series seems to end with a full confession, sometimes prompted by what seems to be pretty flimsy evidence of guilt. All it seems to take is for David Caruso to stand sideways in front of a suspect mouthing something profound as he puts his sunglasses on and briskly walks away. If you haven't seen it, there's a great Jim Carrey imitation of that on an old Letterman episode. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul complicate the very notion of confession. They underscore the sheer difficulty of telling or even knowing the truth about oneself. Their approach resembles less the mainstream police procedural than it does something like the universe of Dostoevsky, particularly in his crime thriller, Crime and Punishment, featuring a penurious student, Raskolnikov, who commits a murder while caught in the grips of Western theories, an odd mix of Nietzsche's Superman and utilitarianism. As you may know, the detective from that book, Porphyry, was the model for Lieutenant Columbo originally. That book develops a whole series of subgenres of the confession. These include the self-justifying confession that provides a rationale for evil deeds, the cruel and proud confession that seeks to inflict pain on those close to the evildoer, confession as a mocking performance intended to shock or intimidate others, confession as an occasion to relive the thrill of the crime, and the false self-incriminating confession of someone eager to inflict pain upon himself out of a pious, if disordered, desire for atonement. That's not Raskolnikov, but another character in the book who actually falsely confesses to the murders out of a need to suffer and seeking atonement. Now, consider just some of Walt's confessions toward the end of the series. He makes a hypothetical confession to Hank, his brother-in-law and DEA agent, once Hank suspects him of being Heisenberg, when he says, if I am the sort of man you think I am, you would do well to tread lightly. 
The point of that confession is to intimidate Hank. Another confession, a taped confession, is a bold lie that implicates Hank as the mastermind of the drug industry. That occurs in an episode whose very title is Confessions. Later, in a retaliatory act against his former student and drug-making assistant, Jesse, he confesses that he watched his girlfriend, Jane, die. I watched her overdose and choke to death. I could have saved her, but I didn't. The point here is to torment Jesse. Then, as the police close in on him in a phone call to his wife, Skylar, whose phone he knows is being monitored by the police, he confesses with a mixture of truth and falsity that the crimes were all his doing and that whatever she may have done, she did only because she feared reprisal from him. Here he aims to protect Skylar from prosecution. Later, he calls his son at school and admits that his confesses to terrible mistakes, but adds that the reasons were always good. This self-justifying confession ends with his son cursing his very existence. Then there is that final confession, the one cited by the producers as marking the end of the line. But this is hardly a standard confession of guilt. He confesses that he has not been telling the truth, yes. His telling of the truth here is an admission only of his self-aggrandizing ambitions. There's no hint of an apology. In fact, he brags about his success. Final confessions usually involve some loss of agency, at least the agency of the sort that the perpetrator had hitherto exercised. Sometimes confessions involve the exercise of agency in another direction. When Raskolnikov finally enters the police station and confesses to murder, he's incapacitated. After he enters prison, he has a long period of inactivity. Finally, in the book's last chapter, there are stirrings of rebirth in his soul, with his agency somewhat revived and moving in a new direction. If the producers of Breaking Bad had wanted that sort of conclusion, at least the first part, the incapacitation of agency, they might have ended the series with the episode Ozymandias, with its evocation of Shelley's famous poem. In this case, the ending could have underscored the boundless and bare kingdom of Walt's colossal wreck. At the time, Vince Gilligan called Ozymandias the third to last episode in the season, the best episode we've ever written or ever will write. But the series doesn't end with a solitary Walt in ruins or even with Walt alone and dying of cancer as it might have in Granite State, the second to last episode. In fact, the ending, Felina, gives Walt a great deal of agency. He performs his role as a criminal mastermind in an extravagant way. Criminal mastermind, that's what Hank's wife Marie calls him when she calls Skylar to warn her that Walt is back in town. Marie said, he's an arrogant asshole who thinks he's some criminal mastermind. Indeed he is, both. Consider just some of the things he pulls off in that final episode. He visits Gretchen and Elliot and with the help of Skinny Pete and Badger, terrifies them into serving his aim of providing financially for his family. In one of many scenes in the last episode that require near complete control of events and exquisite timing, Walt both assists his family and exacts a bit of revenge against the arch nemesis couple. In broad daylight and in a quite public place, he manages to poison one of his other drug dealing colleagues, Lydia. In fact, in a phone call later, he even gets to give her the news that the illness she's now suffering from is fatal and he caused it. Then in a remarkable feat of engineering, he turns the trunk of a car into a mobile assault weapon that he uses to slaughter Jack and his team, the group that had killed his brother-in-law and taken Walt's money. In the final plan of the final episode, Walt's timing and verbal dexterity have to be operating at peak performance level for him to achieve the aim that he had announced to Saul when they were bunkmates awaiting relocation. I'm going to kill Jack and his team and take back what's mine. Having been fatally wounded in the violent denouement, the writers afford him just enough time before the police arrive to walk around the meth lab gently stroking the canisters. His manner there mirrors quite closely 
the way he had stroked his daughter's cheek just moments earlier in his final visit with Skylar. All this occurs as the upbeat Badfinger song, Baby Blue, blares out the lyrics, Did you really think that I'd forget and regret that special love I have for you, my baby blue? The final scene seemed to celebrate Walter in the way the series often did. One of the most powerful things about the presentation of the evil deeds of Walt is the way the creators mixed it with sympathetic presentations of his character, with him showing affection for his son or infant daughter, with him settling scores with individuals for whom the audience had no sympathy, from evil drug lords to obnoxious stockbrokers. In the midst of calculated evil, Walt is often portrayed as remorseful, or at least showing some regret. When he confesses to Jesse that he watched Jane die, we know that the scene was a bit more complicated. As he watches her choke to death, a tear runs down his cheek. Apparently, the original script had Walt injecting her and thus directly causing her overdose. A later revision had Walt turning her on her back as she was choking to help her die. Instead, the scene they ended up with minimizes Walt's act of commission. His is a sin of omission, tempered somewhat by regret. In the finale, Walt settles multiple scores, all with individuals who merit punishment. Then he lets Jesse go, and that also contributes to a sympathetic portrayal of him at the end. Above all, the finale mesmerizes us with Walt's creative artistry, which runs through the entire series, not just in the quality of the baby blue meth, but even more in his orchestration of events in a way that promotes a kind of awe in the audience. Heisenberg, the scientist, is also Picasso, the artistic genius. Felina is his concluding work of art. The colossal rack, to quote Ozymandias again, that he leaves behind is a deliberate work of destructive artistry. If Walt has almost Nietzschean Superman ambitions, Jimmy, Saul, Gene has only ordinary aspirations. When we first meet him, his chief desire in the in Better Call Saul, his chief desire is acceptance and affection and recognition from his brother, Chuck, the brilliant and successful attorney. In fact, roughly the first half of that series focuses on Jimmy's unrequited affection for his brother. In a sequence of violently escalating encounters, Jimmy seeks approval from Chuck, and Chuck, with increasing ruthlessness, thwarts him. In response, Jimmy often succumbs to juvenile impulses for retaliation, and eventually gives up the family name to become Saul Goodman. Jimmy's hostility toward Chuck turns to animosity toward members of the law firm, particularly toward Howard Hamlin. But all is not lost for him. He has Kim Wexler, Ray Seahorn, at his side, a character not mentioned in Breaking Bad, whose role as Jimmy's partner in misadventure comes to dominate that series. Their relationship constitutes one of the most peculiar and compelling love stories in TV history. C.S. Lewis once remarked that friendship often begins with one person exclaiming to another, what, you too? The magical connection between Jimmy and Kim is both negative and positive. They share a distaste for the hypocritical world of corporate law. Conversely, they share in the thrill of the well-played con. Yet there's something more here. The more polished Kim often acts as a mediator between Jimmy and the world of corporate responsibility or respectability. She tempers him. Her affection provides solace for and to some extent even heals the wounds caused by his brother's rejection. And his desire for her respect and affection indicates that there's something more than crude opportunism operative in his soul. Combining their resources, their scheming becomes increasingly complex, ruthless, and malevolent. Some of their ruses are harmless enough. In fact, they often involve helping underdogs or undermining the powerful and arrogant. 
viewers thus sympathized with them, just as they did, was just as they were often led to sympathize with Walt, when Breaking Bad writers would pit him against unattractive characters. Now, Kim, one of whose passions is pro bono legal work, is more admirable than either Walt or Jimmy. Yet, as the series progresses, Kim becomes even more intoxicated by treacherous ploys than Jimmy is. In one of the defining moments of the series, just as they are about to launch the final stage of their plot against Howard Hamlin, whom they are falsely framing as a drug addict, Kim is driving to a meeting that promises to fulfill her dream of a career devoted to pro bono work. When she learns that a key element in the plot has come undone, she recklessly makes a U-turn to try to fix things. She thus sacrifices an admirable professional dream in order to satisfy darker desires. The harrowing, if unintended, consequence of her dark desire is Lalo's execution of Howard Hamlin. After the murder, which occurs in their living room, both Kim and Saul are stupefied. As we shall shortly see in a clip, Saul has a special reason for being shocked, as he thought Lalo was dead and no longer a threat to them. Despite the devastation, Saul, resilient here in the wrong way, begins to recover and urges that they can and should move beyond this event. Kim is unable or unwilling or both, even if she's initially nowhere near close to confessing. In fact, when the couple attends the firm's memorial service for Howard, Kim gives her last and most cruel performance. They offer condolences to Howard's wife, Cheryl, who angrily insists that Howard was not on drugs and accuses them of tarnishing his reputation. Kim calmly and effortlessly concocts a story, a lie, that she discovered Howard alone late one night in his office doing drugs. Then in a tone of regret, she says, I wish I had said something then. When Cheryl looks hurt and alarmed, Kim leans into her and says, surely you would have known. Kim's a much more compelling actor and thus a much better con artist than Saul ever will be. As Kim and Saul depart the memorial service, they find themselves alone in the parking garage. They face each other in silence. She then leans into him, kisses him passionately, and without saying a word, gets in her car and drives away. We soon learn that she has given up her law license. When Saul hears about this, he's aghast, but still thinks there's a way to put this behind us. Saul thinks he can persuade her until he walks into the bedroom and finds her things partially packed. Jimmy! You asked if you were bad for me. That's not it. We are bad for each other. Kim, don't do this. Kim, please. Jimmy, I have had the time of my life with you. But we are bad for everyone around us. Other people suffer because of us. Apart, we're... Okay, but together, we're poison. No, no, just tell me what I need to do to change, okay? Just tell me what it is and I'll do it. Jimmy. No, Kim, you make me happy. We make each other happy. How can that be bad? Hey, I love you. I love you, too. But so what? No. No. No, Kim, you're wrong. This is about Howard. Okay, what happened to him wasn't on us. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't my fault. 
We said, fucking Lalo Salamanca. That psychopath came back from the dead and he walked through that door. He did this, not us, him. I knew. You knew what? what? I knew he was alive. No, you didn't. It was about a month ago. I saw that car following me again. And it turned out that Mike Ermintrout had guys watching both of us, watching for Lalo. And Mike, Mike told you that Lalo was alive. And you didn't tell me? I thought, I thought it was a one in a million chance that he'd come for us. I thought he would be caught if he did. And I told myself I was protecting you. But that's not the truth. The, the real reason I didn't tell you was because I knew what you'd do. What would I do? You'd, you'd blame yourself. You'd fear for me. You'd want us to run and hide until you were sure I was safe. You would pull the plug on the scam and then... And then, uh, we'd break up. And I didn't want that. Because I was having too much fun. Sound of the packing tape is one of those nice, great little effects that we get all the time in these series. She kept the information about Lalo from Saul because she knew he'd pulled the plug on the scam and she was having too much fun. It's striking how similar in important ways her confession is to that of Walter White. She's saying something like, I did it for myself because I was good at it and I felt alive. The difference, of course, is that her confession contains a self-accusing and remorseful accusation, recognition that she caused others to suffer. The realization in this scene, at least on Kim's part, that they are bad for one another and for others is a painful one given how fond they are of one another. It's not just that they have fun together scamming others. They are deeply fond of one another. A chance friendship brought together by a shared insight into corporate pretentiousness and an appreciation for pranks. Theirs is a friendship that defies Aristotelian categories of imperfect friendship, friendships of pleasure or utility. It's both better and worse. Better, because they do indeed have genuine affection for one another. Worse, because the chemistry between them ignites their worst instincts, their desire for amoral, performative artistry. Pascal makes an important point about friendship that's relevant. Our minds and feelings are trained by the company we keep and perverted by the company we keep. Thus, good or bad company trains or perverts, respectively. It's therefore very important to be able to make the right choice so that we train rather than pervert. And we cannot make this choice unless the character is already trained and not perverted. This is thus a vicious circle from which anyone is lucky to escape. The circularity in the relationship between friendship and character can be fruitful if one is inside the right kind of circle already a circle of virtuous friends. But how do we get there if we're not already virtuous? Kim sees something diametrically opposed to the possibility 
a virtuous friendship in the affections she shares with Jimmy. Theirs, she thinks, is a vicious circle. Kim alone sees and has the capacity to act on that insight, that they must escape this circle. That means the end of the friendship. What allows her to make this choice, the right choice, over the course of the seasons of Better Call Saul, Kim's character became increasingly prominent with an increasingly passionate fan base. She embodies something like the moral conscience in the soul of a character who finds herself incapable of suppressing its nagging accusations. During a panel discussion before the last episode, actually right after the second to last episode, Seahorn described her character as doing penance, seeking atonement, and recoiling, in quotes, from the erosion of her own conscience. Having left Saul after the scene we just saw, Kim settles for a nondescript middle-class life in Florida with a desk job at Palm Coast Sprinkler, a company whose tagline is, watering your world since 1978 and a dull boyfriend who in the very middle of sex repeatedly says, yep. <laughs> when Saul decides to call her from a payphone, they have a brief intense conversation. This is that great split scene, right, where we initially don't know what's being said. We just see Saul wanting to destroy the phone booth, and then later we know what was said. He brags to her that it's been six years, and he's still getting away with it. She tells him that he should turn himself in, to which he retorts, why don't you turn yourself in? You're the one with the guilty conscience. When we see her again, she's doing precisely that, confessing to her role in Howard's death. In a set of silent scenes, we see her taking a flight, getting, a, getting on a rental car shuttle bus, and then getting a rental car to go visit Cheryl. In her office, she hands Cheryl a long typed confession and adds that an affidavit has been filed with the DA. Cheryl is irate. That story you made up about Howard, that's all he is now. Then Cheryl asks, why are you doing this? The camera gives us Kim sitting with a blank stare. Soon we see Kim back in the rental car shuttle bus.
powerful scenes, in part because of the lack of artistry. Her confession is matter of fact, and when she finally erupts in convulsive emotion, it's in the presence of complete strangers on a rental car shuttle bus. There's no performing here. There's great acting, but there's no performing here, at least not for anyone else. Kim's the rare character who is admirable, initially at least, not because of what she does, but because she was of what she is unable to continue doing. Hers is a soul incapable of stamping out the natural instinct to recoil from evil, especially when we are its perpetrators. That eventually spurs action of a different sort, not deceiving others or herself, but truth-telling in the form of self-accusation. She thus gives testimony to the presence of a power deeper and higher than any mere human desire. Of that power, Thomas Aquinas writes, conscience is said to witness, to bind, or incite, and also to accuse, torment, or rebuke. John Henry Newman expands on this point. He speaks of the piercing pain and sharp remorse which conscience inflicts upon the mind. In accord with her remorse, Kim willingly sacrifices her previous agency and begins to exercise a new quasi-penitential agency. Even after he's caught, Saul's not stung by remorse. Just as Breaking Bad gave Walt a great deal of agency in its conclusion, so too does Better Call Saul with Gene Saul Jimmy. Saul Gone, the title of the final episode, is a play on It's All Gone in precisely the way that Saul Goodman is a play on It's All Good, Man. The ending might have been the story of the loss of agency of its main character. This would have been a great ending, huh? Imagine the series ending with Saul emerging from that dumpster, surrounded by police, humiliated and out of options, undone by the simple homespun morality of Carol Burnett, oh, I mean Marion. Booked and incarcerated, Saul initially seems oblivious to his plight. He uses a call from prison to call the Cinnabon and advise his co-worker about how to handle things in his absence. Soon, though, he lawyers up. What ensues are the two most riveting Saul performances in the entire series. The first is vintage Saul, while the second will allow him some freedom from Saul, even if Saul is not, as the title suggests, all gone and never will be. At an initial sentences meeting, Saul learns that he is facing a sentence of life plus 190 years. Undaunted, he orchestrates a stunning reversal. Noticing Hank's wife Marie present in a waiting room, he asks that she be invited into the hearing. Now bringing the wife of a police officer, community hero, and slain victim of Walter White's projects would not seem to be the best courtroom strategy for Saul. Yet it gives him an opportunity to demonstrate his tremendous power of persuasion. After Marie talks about Hank and his partner Steve Gomez and their virtues, Saul nods and concedes her point. You are victims and so am I. He goes on to talk about how he lived in constant fear of Walt, the master of evil. He concludes, you're looking at a man who has lost everything. I have nothing. A preposterous defense, perhaps. But fearing that Saul's testimony may well win over at least one juror, the prosecutors are forced to negotiate a plea deal. And now Saul is off and running. He talks them down eventually to a sentence of 7.5 years to be served in a posh prison with a golf program. When Saul tries to get even more perks, Blue Bell ice cream, by promising information on Howard Hamlin's death, the DA laughs and tells him that Kim has already given up that information. Saul looks startled and hurt. As he is being flown to his final court appearance, he promises information that will implicate Kim, who hears of his plan and decides to attend the hearing. Slickly dressed, Saul enters the courtroom and takes notice of Kim's nervous presence. He makes a request to address the court, during which he surprisingly confesses that he was at the very center of Walter White's drug empire, going so far as to say that Walt couldn't have done it without him. He turns to Kim and they stare at one another. 
He then confesses to the harm he did to his brother, to which his own lawyer says, that wasn't even a crime. He concludes by requesting to be addressed as McGill. Saul has found a way back through Kim to a sense of self that beginning with his break from his brother had dissipated over the years. He returns to the past not as a curse, but as a resource that nourishes a better life in the present. The disruption of linear narrative, the moving back and forth between present, past, and future, is characteristic of the cinematic universe of both Breaking Bad and perhaps especially Better Call Saul. The temporal shifts reward attentive viewers, but especially in the finale here, they also allow for something deeper, a reconsideration of past misdeeds and regrets. Both Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul end with allusions to their openings, in the finale of Breaking Bad, Walt is wearing the clothes he wore in the pilot. While the penultimate scene in Better Call Saul has Kim and Saul sharing a cigarette and leaning against a wall, just as they had done in the opening. In the final episode, time travel comes up in three scenes, each of which itself is a flashback. I'm going to talk briefly about the second and third by way of conclusion. There's a flashback to Walt and Saul when they were in the holding cell awaiting relocation after their crimes have been discovered. When Saul asks about time travel, Walt balks at the scientific impossibility, at the stupidity of Saul, as always, but then says, what you're really talking about is regret. Walt states that he would have made a different decision in grad school and not left his original creation, gray matter, technology. Walt wants to go back in time to reverse the course of a life that seems to have made it impossible for him to escape from the vicious cycle of acts that he has performed. He hints at something like a state that Aquinas calls perplexity. Aquinas summarizes it in this way. It seems that every act of willing that belongs to a man whose reason is mistaken or whose will is disordered is invariably bad. And so the man in question will be in a dilemma, eret perplexus, and will of necessity sin. Of course, Aquinas is considering the claim that sin will be necessary, not as something he wants to affirm, but as an objection to his own view. In his response, he expands on the conditions for such cases. Just as in syllogistic reasoning, when one incongruity is granted, other incongruities necessary follow, so too in moral matters. When one incongruity is posited, others follow by necessity. For instance, on the assumption that someone is seeking empty glory, he will sin regardless of whether what he is obligated to do is such that he does it because of vainglory, or he fails to do it. So Aquinas notes that there are circumstances in which having committed an evil deed, or being under the impulse or influence of a vicious motive, the committing of evil will seem necessary. Yet he goes on to say, such a person is not in a dilemma, perplexus, since he can abandon his bad intention. Unlike Walt, Kim found a way to abandon her bad intention. She shows that such an error is, as Aquinas puts it, vincible and voluntary. In response to Walt's regret, the best Saul can do is to say that he would have avoided an early slip and fall con job that left him with physical injuries. It's notable, of course, what he doesn't say here. He doesn't regret becoming Slipping Jimmy, the guy who constructs fake injury claims as the basis of frivolous lawsuits. In the first place, scornfully, Walt taunts him, you were always like this. After that flashback, the camera returns to the present, with a pensive Saul on the plane, traveling, looking away from everyone else, traveling to his sentencing hearing. That's the moment when he launches his plot to lure Kim to the courtroom. Viewers are left in doubt at this moment as to his intentions, but the juxtaposition of Walt's accusation, you were always this way, and his initiating the plot involving Kim raises the question for viewers of whether he will be borne back ceaselessly into his dark, mediocre, sleazy past, or whether he can recover something from that past that will ennoble his present. The final time machine flashback is a conversation between Chuck and Jimmy. 
during which a copy of H.G. Wells' Time Machine can be seen on a desk. When Jimmy complains about his low-life client, Chuck advises him, if you don't like where you're headed, there's no shame in going back and changing paths. But he quickly adds, when have you ever changed your path? We always end up having the same conversation. Here we have the theme of recurrence as dead-end repetition, the frustration of any possibility of progress or growth. Of course, Jimmy is always changing, ever adaptable to circumstances. He's James, Jimmy, Saul, Gene, and many other short-lived personae. Such flexibility makes for superficial change as a kind of performative malleability, but it doesn't allow for growth. Beneath his preparation to meet the faces that he meets, to butcher a line from T.S. Eliot, whatever unified self he has seems to be one of self-interested manipulation of others and circumstances. Such a life would seem to rule out integrity, a life with a moral center, characterized by continuity of motivation over time and in different circumstances. Even at the end, when he recovers his McGill identity, he has not necessarily shed his personae. He's still going to be Saul, celebrated by fellow inmates for his previous willingness to defend the sort of individuals who now constitute his prison family, and he'll still be Gene, putting his Cinnabon baking skills to good use in the prison bakery. But that doesn't mean that all is lost. The question for Jimmy is whether another path is possible. Is he what Walt and Chuck cynically assume him to be? Viewers know that in his relationship with Chuck, at least early on, he was motivated by a love and desire for sibling recognition. We know that he cares for Kim in that breakup scene that we just watched, in which he desperately tries to persuade Kim not to leave. His confession of love is genuine. Kim believes in possibilities for Jimmy that he himself often has difficulty even imagining. But she also loves and loves passionately the con artist in Jimmy. That's the dilemma. The one person whose love and friendship he most needs sees that they are incapable of self-restraint when together. But now, at the end, with Jimmy confessing and facing a life in prison, the possibility of destructive scheming is minimized, even if the ending does allow Kim one small last deception in using her expired lawyer identification card to gain access to Jimmy in prison. In the absence of the possibility of plots that are, in the immortal words of Skinny Pete, kind of shady, you know, morality-wise, the part of Kim that loved the goodness in Jimmy has given him some degree of a new life. Like Walt, Saul gets a final performance that enables him to reenact what he was good at. But there are significant differences. Alone with his precious, as Gilligan put it, Walt has vindicated himself against his rivals. He has no peers left and no one to whom he's devoted, no one who calls him to anything better or even challenging him. The audience for his performance is ultimately himself. By contrast, Saul is performing for someone else, for Kim, who is more than ever the center of this universe. Instead of dying alone, he ends up in prison, surrounded by those who understand and appreciate him. And he has the memory now that he lived up to what Kim saw in him. It is, to my mind, one of the most satisfying endings of any major TV series, and we've seen a lot of great major TV series in the last 30 years or so. It, that ending is made possible by many things, but especially, I would say, by Kim's conscience. Of course, there's nothing explicitly religious about conscience in this universe. So someone might find my allusions, even as brief as they are, to Aquinas and Newman inappropriate or misleading. Yet Gilligan's own words put in doubt that doubt, or at least leave the origin and justification of conscience as a live question. About the entire Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul universe, Gilligan offered a personal reflection. I'm pretty much agnostic at this point in my life, but I find atheism just as hard to get my head around as I find fundamental Christianity. 
Because if there is no such thing as comic justice, what is the point of being good? That's the one thing that no one has ever explained to me. Why shouldn't I go rob a bank, especially if I'm smart enough to get away with it? What's stopping me? Thank you. <laughs>